well, basically different places in Europe. Um, and each time some group came, they formed their own little uh, church denomination. They didn't want to associate because the Slovaks wanted to do their service in Slovak. The Finns wanted to do it in Finnish. The Germans in German. The Swedes in Swedish. Yeah. And the, the few German people, the you know, Danes wanted to do it in Danish. And second generations uh, didn't know the languages, so they wanted to do it in English. Third generations definitely wanted to do it in English, so... Uh, we came to mergers. All right, are we ready, Doug? We're all ready. So again, thank you for coming. We're just going to quickly review 30 years, go back 30 years in our time machine to look at what the Lutheran Church has said about uh, abortion. As you can see, we have a social statement on abortion. You can see the logo here for the Lutheran Church is a lot different than what the new logo is. So uh, we're going old school. But before we go back just 30 years, we're going to go back even a little bit further. Anybody recognize the card? Did you have one of those? <laughs> Ford Fairlane. There you go. Oh, wow. Ford Fairlane. I figured since it was uh, Independence Day, we'd look at Pilgrim Lutheran Church. But Okay, so we're going to go back in time here. And I'm not going to go back too far, only back to uh, when Gary became a Lutheran in the early 60s. Because <laughs> below this, there is a tree that branches out from a lot of different smaller groups that come together to form these two main groups, the Lutheran Church in America and the American Lutheran Church. If that's not too confusing, is it, right? <laughs> the one in the middle, the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, was actually formed by a breakaway group from the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So uh, they, they, uh, it was seminary people who actually broke away from that, and it's a whole debacle that we don't need to get into. Anyway, we're going to look at the these two uh, predecessor churches which came together in 1987 to become the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. They had predecessor social statements. And so we're going to look just quickly at those because originally the ELCA just adopted those statements before coming up with their own in 1991. So let's look back in history. Uh, but first we're going to talk about the ELCA. Uh, it reports having 5.1 million members in 2001, or 2002, I'm sorry, and uh, 26, what is it? Uh, I don't know, there was something, a number of the congregations, I didn't put that in here, I guess. Okay. Oh, there we go, 10,766 congregations, right? Sounds good. Uh, in 2020, there were 3.3 million baptized members in the ELCA, and only eight. 1,900 congregations. So we're getting smaller. Uh, the reason we are getting smaller is multiple reasons, but one of them is that uh, conservative, more conservative Lutherans break away. And there have been issues in the church that have caused more conservative groups to break away from the ELCA. One was uh, homosexuality, the ordination of homosexual pastors, uh, one was abortion, another was, believe it or not, whether or not we were going to be in relationship with Episcopalians. Yeah, because they have bishops, and uh, it was a really, and that was a big breakaway. A lot of people broke away. Uh, and so what's happening, and of course, uh, there are unfortunately more Lutherans dying than are being born. Uh, population is declining, of course. Uh, and uh, so our church is becoming a bit more liberal as it goes along. Uh, and that's a, something to think about as we uh, move into the future, but we're looking into the past. So I just wanted a snapshot. It was a bigger church in the past when we made these statements. Just for your own uh, interest, we're looking at a time period uh, when we had the biggest bump in ELCA membership. Now, this is previous, the previous uh, iterations of the ELCA, but you can see it was a spike up there in about 1970. That was our high water mark. And then since then, we've been uh, kind of dropping off and dropping off in percentage of population. And if you just are interested in future predictions from the ELCA, it's pretty bleak. Uh, doesn't look so good. We're going to go. We are at 3.2 million members right now, or 3.1 million members. And you can see the projection is in 2050 to have only 66,000. So uh, 
Fortunately, most of us won't be seeing 2050, I think, but uh, some of us will. I'll probably still be working at Grace in 2050. So. <laughs> average weekly attendance, this is even pre-COVID, uh, so it really drops off. Anyway, that's the picture of what the ELCA looks like. Uh, I wanted to find the earliest statement in the Lutheran Church about abortion, just to give us some historical context. And the earliest I could find was 1954 from the Augustana Lutheran Church. And here's what they said. Should an unexpected pregnancy occur, the Christian couple will accept the responsibility involved, prayerfully seek the blessing God offers, and be ready to accord the new child the love due him. Except as a medical measure to save the mother's life, Abortion will not be resorted to by Christians. In obedience to the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Sounds familiar, right? I mean, there are still Christians who hold this position today. That was the position of the church. You can see it's kind of an old statement because it's only male children that are uh, worried about female children. You don't have to worry about that. Now, just for fun, this statement from the Augustana Lutheran Church also said, in planning their family, a married couple would wisely heed the psalmist who pointed out the special blessings that may accrue to large families and the rich joys from children born in one's youth. They are more than they are then more likely also to experience the truth that grandchildren are the crown of the aged. Proverbs 17. So have many kids and have them young, basically. I guess Lutherans didn't heed that uh, calling because the Otherwise, the trend would be going in the other direction. Also, just for fun, this statement in 1954 said, a married couple desirous of children but seeming unable to have any of their own should seek competent medical counsel. In their desire for help, they will not neglect the resource of prayer to which Rachel and Hannah, among the company of noted women, turned in their barrenness. Oh, boy. Can you imagine? <laughs> Yeah, I would, uh, I would be out if all of a sudden I said to somebody, oh, I'm sorry you're barren. I'm sure that if you prayed enough, God would overcome your barrenness and forgive you the sin that you've committed. Uh, you know, it's just unbelievable. Okay, but that was 1954. Uh, looking... It doesn't say that they assigned sin to that. No, but uh, the implication in the prayer of Rachel and Hannah is that there was something wrong with these women, that God was not blessing them with children, right? So they were not blessed women, although they turned out to be blessed women, but the initial impression was they were not. All right, so the next statement we get is in 1974 with the American uh -huh. Lutheran Church. And the American Lutheran Church was the more liberal of the two predecessor bodies. It says that it accepts abortion may be a necessary option. Each person needs to be free to make this choice in light of each individual situation. And then later in the statement, they say, we have no need to itemize a list of circumstances under which abortion is acceptable or forbidden. Wow, that is a perfect Lutheran state statement. It says, well, you can do whatever you want, kind of, you know. We're not going to make a stand on anything. They do say it, they have a pro-life position. By that, it is, does not mean what we mean when we say they're pro-life. For them, it means we are pro-life, as in the sense of we want to advocate for life, not in the sense of we're pro-life versus pro-choice. Uh, it takes seriously the right of the developing fetus to be born, which is a statement we should pay attention to because that's going to come up again when we get to the current uh, statement. All right. Any questions or any thoughts about this one? We're going to go on. Now, the right of the fetus has been debated uh, on the issue. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to come back to that, Chris. We will. Okay, so uh, again in the statement, much perf preferable is action to prevent a possible problem pregnancy. Human sexuality only expressed within a marriage relationship of permanent commitment, love, and faithfulness. I like how the marriage relationship is even qualified here. It's not any marriage relationship, just a permanent one that involves love and faithfulness. Uh, the church promotes the research and development and use of contraception, uh, which was controversial. You know, your Roman Catholic friends, of course, back in 1974 would have been aghast about the fact the church was saying anything about that. Uh, the church should teach self-control. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> the, the footnote there says confirmation class. You know. <laughs> 
uh, advocate for social programs sustaining health, income, and education. And each one of these uh, is kind of a root that we're going to see grows into something else as the statements uh, continue on. Uh, just a, a little a referral back to contraception, back to the Augustana 1954. Continence in the marriage relationship, however, now continence, anybody know what continence is? It doesn't have anything to do with where the, the bladder. It doesn't have anything to do with the bladder. Thank you. The nurse says, right. No, it, it has to do with abstinence from sexual intercourse. So continence in the marriage relationship, however, when its sole purpose is the selfish avoidance of pregnancy, is equally as wrong as in the use of contraception toward the same selfish goal. That was 1954. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> We've moved on. Okay, so 1980, same uh, sub-denomination, the American Lutheran Church, they added some more specifics to their 1974 position six years earlier. This time they said the third trimester abortion is only allowed to protect the life of the mother. And amniocentesis, now I didn't do any research about amniocentesis, but was that kind of a new thing in the 70s? Yeah, you know? yeah. because they made a lot about it uh, in their 80s statement. Mm -hmm. An amniocentesis showing, quote, a genetic disease and or developmental abnormality does not require, but may permit an abortion. Uh, yeah, uh, it was... Uh, a bit unnerving, actually, how the statement was relying on, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. We can figure out how to keep from having these handicapped children. I was like, whoa, really? But that's 1980. Teach and advocate that men take responsibility to raise and support their child and children. <laughs> this was a, a, another a big deal, as we're going to see, uh, the male role in both responsibility in procreation and responsibility in care for children. Uh, again, I was too young to remember the 1980s as far as you know gender roles, but those of you who do remember, does this resonate with, oh yeah, this is what was being talked about. We needed to have men take a bigger role in all of that. Yeah? I don't see any nodding heads, but you know, whatever. Yeah, okay. Uh, a qualitative distinction must be made between the claims of a fetus and the rights of a responsible person made in God's image who is in living relationships with God and other human beings. This understanding of responsible personhood is congruent with the historical Lutheran teaching and practice whereby only living persons are baptized. On the basis of the evangelical ethic, a woman or a couple may decide responsibly to seek an abortion. Okay, so uh, I put the whole paragraph in here because you get to see that it was clergy who were the majority at these conventions that were passing these social statements. So, I mean, it's really fascinating, at least to me, that the, the uh, basis for the understanding of how to deal with abortion is on the fact that we only baptize the living, right? So you've got to be born in order to be baptized. And so that means who has primacy as far as attention and rights? It's the woman, the one who is living, right? The understanding is the fetus is not quite the same, which is why it's okay for a couple to responsibly seek an abortion based on a theology of baptism. All right. Moving on. Hello, there we go. Oh. Okay, so uh, moving on to 1991, when uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church is making its statement, and uh, it begins by recognizing that there's a lot of diverse opinions out there and in the church. Induced abortion, the act of intentionally terminating a developing life in the womb, is one of the issues about which members of the ELCA have serious differences. These differences are also found within society. So I looked up a uh, Gallup poll, the history of you know, the questions they asked, three questions, uh, legal under any circumstance, legal un under uh, only certain circumstances, or illegal under all circumstances. And uh, I was just fascinated to find that the lines are kind of flat really, as you look from 1976 is all, all the way over here, and 2022 is right here, and, you know, they're pretty much statistically flat 
there hasn't been. But you do see that there's a, there is significant di differences within the church and within society. Okay, so this is, we are now embarking on the current statement of the church, 1991 ELCA statement. And there are reasons to allow an abortion. This church recognizes that there can be sound reasons for ending a pregnancy through induced abortion. Because of our conviction that both the life of a woman and the life in her womb must be respected by law, this church opposes the total lack of regulation of abortion and legislation that would outlaw abortion in all circumstances. Does anybody find that surprising for the church to say that? No? Okay. But we encourage continuing the pregnancy. Because of the Christian presumption to preserve and protect life, this church, in most circumstances, encourages women with unintended pregnancies to continue the pregnancy. Faith and trust in God's promises has the power to sustain people in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Okay, so kind of a balanced, mitigated. Anybody surprised that the church would be saying this? No? Okay. Threat to the life of the mother. We're all familiar with this. An abortion is morally responsible in those cases in which continuation of a pregnancy presents a clear threat to the physical life of the woman. Non-consensual conception. A woman should not be morally obligated to carry the resulting pregnancy to term if the pregnancy occurs when both parties do not participate willingly in sexual intercourse. This is especially true in cases of rape and incest. This can also be the case in some situations which women are also so dominated and oppressed that they have no choice regarding sexual intercourse and little access to contraceptives. Some, concepts, some conceptions occur under dehumanizing conditions that are contrary to God's purposes. Which is why the church then doesn't just say blanket, no abortion, and doesn't support laws that would say that. Fetal abnormality. Now remember back to the amniocentesis uh, comment in 1980. There are circumstances of extreme fetal abnormality, which will result in severe suffering and the very early death of an infant. In those cases, the church allows for abortion. But not when viability has been reached. Although abortion raises significant moral issues at any stage of fetal development, the closer the life in the womb comes to full term, the more serious such issues become. When a child can survive outside a womb, it becomes possible for other people, and not only the mother, to nourish and care for the child. This church opposes ending interuterine uh, life. Thank you. When a, thank you. <laughs> interuterine life when a fetus is developed enough to live outside a uterus with the aid of reasonable and necessary technology. If a pregnancy needs to be interrupted after this point, every reasonable and necessary effort should be made to support this life, unless there are lethal fetal abnormalities indicating that the prospective newborn will die very soon. Now you can see this is uh, an interesting uh, clause because a lot has changed in medicine and especially in neonatal care since 1991. And so, you know, the, the boundary at which uh, a fetus can viably live outside the womb has come down to, what's the, the lower number now, Karen, would you say? Mm -hmm. 24 weeks at 1,000 grams. Wow, 1,000 grams. Holy cow. One kilogram, huh? Jeez. Wow. So 20, 24, 24 weeks? 24 weeks. 24 weeks, yeah. yeah. Which was not the case in 1991. So, you know, it's uh, something that's... All right. Uh, so that that's the position specifically on abortion, and the church, of course, doesn't just stop there. Being Lutherans, we got to go on a little bit, and I think in a good way because the church wants to uh, suggest that we need to work to mitigate the need for abortions. 
Now, remember back to the other statements where the working on the need to mitigate abortions involved self-control, con contraception, uh, keeping uh, sexual intercourse within marriage, those kinds of things. Keep that in mind as we hear the 1991 statement. Because we believe that God is the creator of life, the number of induced abortions is a source of deep concern to this church. We mourn the loss of life that God has created. The strong Christian presumption is to preserve and protect life. Abortion ought to be an option only of last resort. Therefore, as a church, we seek to reduce the need to turn to abortion as the answer to unintended pregnancies. All right, so we're going to mitigate. How? We're going to address the mother and child's needs. As a community of faith, we seek to live out our support for life in all its dimensions. We are committed to supporting those who face problematic pregnancies in ways that effectively address their immediate as well as their long-term needs. This can include financial, nutritional, medical, educational, social, and psychological, as well as spiritual support. Okay, pretty big commitment. Mm -hmm. Congregations are encouraged to support daycare centers and nurseries in their facilities. Teach abstinence outside of marriage. Marriage is the appropriate context for sexual intercourse. This continues to be the position of this church. We affirm that the goodness of sexual intercourse goes beyond its procreative purpose. Whenever sexual intercourse occurs apart from the intent to conceive, the use of contraceptives is the responsibility of the man and of the woman. Our congregations and church schools ought to provide sex education in the context of the Christian faith. Such education, beginning in the elementary years, needs to emphasize values such as responsibility, mutuality, and abstinence from sexual intercourse outside of marriage. Anybody see any problems with this today? <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine if I was to say, hey, we need to get sex education into our Sunday school program starting with the first grade class? Right. How many people are going to sign their kids up for Sunday school for, you know? Oh, yeah, we'll start in the fall with a unit on sex education. Uh, I mean, it, does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It really makes sense. Is it practical for us to be able to do that? I, I know. I, I used to feel more comfortable being able to talk about the sixth commandment in confirmation class. Everybody knows the sixth commandment. It's the Bill Clinton commandment. But <laughs> just a little aside, I, I uh, got the Washington Post on a Sunday morning, and they had the Washington Post magazine in there, and big cover story was Bill Clinton and the sixth or the Bill Clinton and the seventh commandment. And I said, what? He's a thief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <true>. Right. <laughs> well, it, it, it was really referring to adultery, but it was the Roman Catholic numbering, not the uh, <laughs> Protestant numbering. Anyway, the Protestant numbering, the sixth commandments about adultery. And, you know, I used to feel more comfortable because Martin Luther says we should so fear and love God that in matters of sex and sexuality, our words and conduct should be honorable. And, we should, and husband and wife should respect and love one another. That's his whole explanation. And so I used to feel more comfortable talking that before, today. Now I feel like I can't say anything without somebody getting, you know, like, especially because, you know, what's the real problem? In 1991, everybody's like, this is fine. But we know, where's Sarah? Sarah, we should ask the question, who are we excluding uh, and who are we uh, oppressing with this statement? Anybody recognize what the problem in 1991 was not, but what's being said behind this statement that in 1991 the church was like, oh yeah, that's what we mean. Homosexuality. That's exactly right, homosexuality, right? Because if you are homosexual, you couldn't be married. If you can't be married, you can't have intercourse. So homosexual intercourse is a sin forbidden by the church, right? Now that position has changed and, you know, the statement hasn't changed because it was 1991 and it's been on the shelf for 30 years and nobody's worried about it. But again, it'll have to be changed a little bit. All right. Uh, teach abstinence outside of marriage. All right. Tough one. 
Support adoptions. The church encourages and seeks to support adoption as a positive option to abortion. Please raise your hand for the number of, if you have heard uh, the church talk about adoption in the last three years. If you've heard the church talk about adoption in the last 10 years. If you've ever heard the church say anything to you about adoption. No. Again, makes sense. Condemn degrading messages. This one I like. This is good. In keeping with our commitment to become communities that are truly life-affirming, this church challenges the following life-degrading attitudes that permeate the prevailing culture and may contribute to the high incidence of abortion. <clears throat> okay, cause and effect may be a little bit loose. But messages in the media and elsewhere that encourage irresponsible sexual activity. Materialism individualism, and excessive concern for self-interest, the desire for perfect children, and treating those who are not as if they were disposable, attitudes and practices that are inhospitable to children and to the women who bear them, low regard of human life, especially the lives of African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, or Native Americans, and of many women and children who are poor. Yeah. Okay. The, the church has taken up some of this, you know, outside of the abortion issue, which is good. Uh, I was curious, back in 1991, again, I was not really someone focused on uh, too many of these issues at that time, but was there a desire for perfect children and a treating of those who are not as disposable? Was there this kind of social milieu where your kid had to have... No, I think this was related to genetic engineering, which yeah. was, you know, sort of coming into its own, and we were going to have these designer kids where they would all be uh, brown hair and brown eyes and five foot two, and Mills looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> They're all supposed to be, you know, Aryan gods, right, who are brilliant scientists, et cetera. I think that's where that comes from, and it just hasn't played itself out in that way. We're not really... Creating kids and in that way. Some of that pastor was, um, you know, kind of the backlash from the ADA uh, federal legislation oh, yeah. saying that you know people with disabilities are, you know, that some of this. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Yeah. People with disabilities. Yep. Okay. Uh, the church should advocate for parental leave because parenthood is a vocation that men, that women and men share. This church oh, this is 1991. 1991. Wow. Wow. This church supports public and private initiatives to provide adequate maternity and paternity leaves, mm -hmm. greater flexibility in the workplace, and efforts to correct the disparity between the incomes of men and women. Wow. 1991. I can tell you that in 1992, when I was negotiating the terms of my first call. I said, so what about paternity leave? And th that's exactly the response I got. No, well, <laughs> yeah, right, that's funny. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> right, uh, because you know nobody thought about paternity leave, right? But the church in 1991 is advocating for that. And now it's a normal part of uh, call processes and uh, negotiating for that. Uh, it's also interesting, of course, that uh, greater flexibility in the workplace in order to accommodate uh, both parents being able to work and also care for children. Uh, oh, sounds good. Charlie, we didn't get faced too much paternity, right? No, I don't think so. The personnel committee is working on it. <laughs> it's in the new personnel handbook. Paternity <laughs> leave. I don't know if we're going to need it, Mill, but you know. <laughs> Hope springs eternal. Right? Uh, yeah, and I think that uh, the disparity between incomes of men and women, that's one that the church has more recently been still working on in their social statements more recently about that. But here it's related to the need to mitigate or the mitigation of the need for abortion. Okay, uh, counseling those considering abortion. This is my favorite little one here, and I'll tell you why in a minute as we hear it. We are called to be a compassionate community, absolutely. Praying and standing with those who struggle with decisions regarding unintended pregnancies, absolutely. We encourage men, women and men to seek support and counsel from family members, pastors, professionals, and confidants whom they trust and respect. 
church members must not only be aware of the moral complexity of the situation, but be able and willing to listen and walk with women and men through the process of decision-making, healing, and renewal, a process that may include feelings such as greed, guilt, relief, denial, regret, or anger. Okay, that's about you all. <laughs> so how many of you uh, have been in a church where there was a public disclosure of a woman and, or a couple who's decided to have an abortion and they were just, you know, up front about it and at Coffee Fellowship were talking about the struggle that they were having about deciding to... No, I mean, abortion's a very, very private and personal uh, thing, right? Even abortion clinics try to make it as private as possible for someone... Right. I mean, I just laugh at this. It's an interesting idea, and of course we want to be a supportive community, but this is not something, you know, it's not like me deciding to go get a colonoscopy or something where I can say, and you know, I'm a little worried about it, and Doug can say, don't worry about it, I've been through it five times. It's a really easy thing to do. You know? This is completely different. It's a little bit strange. Pastors and other members of this church should be trained to provide counsel that is competent and respectful of the integrity of women, the man, and others who may be involved in these decisions. I agree. I can tell you how much uh, training I have had and how much training is available for me to be able to counsel people with some expertise in this. Zero. <laughs> Absolutely none. It is through the public process of our society that they, this is one that I think is really pertinent for us. This, through the, again, it is through the public process of our society that the common good is sought for all. This church encourages its members to participate in the public debate on abortion in a spirit of respect for those with whom they differ, committed to a process of raising and deliberating, deliberating the difficult and unresolved questions. This church encourages its members, informed by faith understandings and by their conscience, to decide and act on this issue in ways that are responsive to God and to the needs of the neighbor. Right? This is where the rubber hits the road for us right now, because we're going to be debating this. It's going to come up. It's going to be the political issue in the fall, and we're going to be talking about it. Uh, and I think the most important thing here is how we talk about it. Because as the statement began, there are differing opinions. We have vast differences in society, with vast differences even within the church. There are some who are so happy that this issue has come back up and about the decision that the Supreme Court has made, and there are others in the church who are just totally distraught about it. I uh, this week went intentionally on YouTube and searched for uh, videos of pastors or uh, theologians talking about abortion from the Lutheran perspective, and I can tell you the guys who are, and it is all guys, who are on YouTube talking about it are really happy about what the Supreme Court has done. And they're from the Lutheran Church, right? So, uh, uh, which one? The ELCA. Oh, yeah. Missouri is against abortion. Yes, I know. And they're, not, they're so clear about it, they don't have to be on YouTube. But the rest of these guys, um, there was a guy talking to a confirmation class in front of Planned Parenthood and saying there are murderers in this building. And he's an ELCA pastor. I'm, oh my gosh, really? Seriously? Talking to a confirmation class. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, you're standing there with some authority. Anyway, it's not. Yeah. Part of my ordination responsibility is that I support the statements of the church and advocate for the statements of the church. I can advocate against them, you know, in debate and that kind of thing. But still, in the face of the public, I echo what the church is saying which I'm comfortable doing, actually. It's not a problem. However, I think that uh, we need to do this in a spirit of respect with whom we differ. That's a tough thing for us to do these days. It is the Eighth Commandment, for those of you who, or the Ninth, if you're Roman Catholic, but the Eighth Commandment, right? Uh, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. We are to so fear and love God that uh, we do not lie or slander our neighbors, but uh, speak well of them and explain their actions in the kindest possible way. Right? And that's in nineteen ninety one. gets into the media. The media only does the other thing. Well, yeah, well, the media is a, a business. We're not a business, which is good. <laughs> we're not trying to make a profit here. And, and we're succeeding in not making a profit. We are. We're doing a great job of that. <laughs> well done, good and faithful. So I think that the, the, the statement 
Uh, and this is not in the order of the statement, so for those of you who read it, you may have not seen that I was putting it together. I tried to put it in together in a way that helped us understand what was in there, rather than because it jumps all over the place uh, for a whole other set of reasons. But uh, it leaves us to say we need to talk like a Lutheran. And actually, this is what begins the statement. The language used in discussing abortion should ignore neither the value of the unborn life nor the value of the woman and her other relationships. It should neither obscure the moral seriousness of the decision faced by the woman nor hide the moral value of the newly conceived life. Nor is it helpful to use the language of rights in absolute ways that imply that no other significant moral claims intrude. A developing life in the womb does not have an absolute right to be born, nor does a pregnant woman have an absolute right to terminate the pregnancy. Now, remember back to the statement earlier where there was an absolute right of the fetus to be born, right? That's changed. And what's being said here in a Lutheran kind of way is that we're not on either extreme of the spectrum. Right? In, in the common terminology, we are neither pro-life nor are we pro-choice. And that's very Lutheran. We're going to be in the middle, in the dialectic tension between those two, recognizing that there are rights and responsibilities uh, for both the woman and the child. The concern for the life of the woman and the developing life in her womb expresses a common commitment to life. This requires that we move beyond the usual pro-life versus pro-choice language in discussing abortion. Right? So, Lutherans are neither pro-life, nor are we pro-choice, but we are pro-life in the sense of supporting life. And you've seen in the statement that that means more than just talking about uh, abortion, but talking about how do we care for the life of mothers and children, of fathers and parents uh, as a church. And the statement was kind of radical in what it suggested that we do. And in good biblical fashion, Oh, I wanted to say two things about the Bible. First, you will not find anything in the Bible about abortion. It is never mentioned. Uh, we always extrapolate from other things in the Bible. Uh, the commandment, as we saw earlier, thou shalt not kill. Right? So that gets extrapolated. There's also a passage from Jeremiah that says, before you were conceived in the womb, I knew you, which I always like it when uh, pastors trot that one out, because then I trot out a little bit later in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah says in, in chapter 20, uh, it would have been better for me not to have been born. I am a poor, miserable soul. It would have been better for my mother to have not had me. Right? So, you know, you get both there. But the other thing is that, uh, uh, what was I going to say about uh, scripture? Um, I can't remember now. I got stuck on that one. Uh, anyway, uh, so there, there's the statement that we have. Anybody have any questions or thoughts about it? <clears throat> well, um, a developing life in the womb does not have an absolute right to be born. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that allows for abortion. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It's the so it's a philosophical philosophic terminology of absolute right, which means an inviolable right. Uh, that it has, so you cannot take away the right for it to have been born, which is the you know the the uh, pro-life extreme of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. No matter what happens, that fetus has a right to be born, regardless of whatever else is going on and whoever else is involved. But how does that fit with the argument of a constitutional right? A constitutional right. Yeah. Well, the Supreme Court just ruled that there is no constitutional right. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who believe there is. Yes, there are. Yeah. Right. Well, a previous court believed there was. Right. Now, current court doesn't. Mm -hmm. So. No, it's a little more indirect than all of that. But okay. That, that's what makes the press. Right. Yeah, I could comment on the legal part of it, but I wanted to stick with the yeah. church's social statement. So. Thank you. Any other questions or any thought? Yeah, sir. The statement does encourage us as members to advocate um, for governmental guidance around this topic as well, right? It does, right. Uh, it 
and encourages us not to uh, support laws which completely abolish the right to abortion, right? That would be the extreme. Uh, nor does it, because again, we're not talking about absolutes, nor do we support uh, an absolute uh, laissez-faire non-involvement of the government with abortion. You can just do whatever you want to do type of thing. Uh, you know, we, we advocate for some regulation, but not too much regulation. Can you go back to that slide, Pastor, that you mentioned something about that I think it said we shouldn't not have any regulation or something. Yeah, that's oh, that was, no, no. that was way back, yeah. That was way back. That's not in this one. Yeah, yeah, 1954. Yeah. So, and I think that there's plenty of other things in the statement and around this issue that we're just ignoring because, as Chris has pointed out, you know, that doesn't hit the media. media you all are like, wow, this is 1991, parental leave? Yeah, and we're not doing anything about that still. I mean, it's it's interesting that Mill would ask, do we have parental leave here for our pastor? Because we are not talking about this. We're not talking about adoptions. We're not talking about uh, contraceptive use or uh, doing any kind of sex education for from a Christian perspective for anybody. Uh, I can't even talk about it to couples who are getting married. Every couple that I'm marrying is already living together, so I'm assuming 99% of them are beyond the point of me needing to talk to them about that. But, uh, yeah. So there are many other things that we need, as Sarah was talking about, advocate for that are beyond just that issue, uh, which makes sense too. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, Brother John. Yeah, I think uh, you made an excellent point about the very pastoral approach to the current issue. As you said in the fall, this will be probably the most divisive question not just on a political angle, but just in social conversations. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most dangerous things is when these uh, moral quagmires become uh, points of division among personal relationships, friendships, and colleagues. And one element which I find beautiful, at least about the ELCA statement here, is the vast need for the church to act as a bridge builder, an opportunity for people to reach beyond the boxes of pro-life or pro-choice, and as you, I think, eloquently put, uh, to be, to be pro-life in the sense of seeing human dignity mm -hmm. and people wrestling with a, a journey, wrestling with their the quest in their day-to-day -day walk with this question. And I guess the one element that comes to my mind, okay, so obviously uh, abortion is highly private. No one's going to basically be saying publicly, oh yeah, I've you know, a few of those last week. Um, it's also too unlikely, given the current political climate, that we're going to hear uh, more liberal voices talking about perhaps uh, having some hesitancy uh, towards, you know, abortion and, for example, more conservative voices saying maybe we took it too far. I would find it fascinating to see voices of moderation rise in a theological and biblical context and how that could happen in a way where, yes, we advocate governmental use, but we also to seek to be stewards as well as students first, so that we don't become the arms of a political movement or the arms of merely you know, activism. Hmm. Thank you, John. Good. Any, uh, if you want to read these statements, they're all online. Just uh, search ELCA abortion and you'll come up with something. The uh, presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, has uh, issued a pastoral letter just at the end of June after the Supreme Court decision. It doesn't really say anything other than, hey, this is our statement from 1991. Remember that? This is kind of what it says, and it's going to get to be a hot issue. So uh, refresh yourselves and be ready. One of the other statements she does refer to is um, social advocacy, which is another statement the ELC has. And it encourages us to be advocates socially in governmental processes, but uh, really uh, forbids us from doing so in violent protest. So we will protest and demonstrate peacefully, but eschew any kind of violence, uh, even if it's on the side of the issue that we are supporting. Uh, she encourages that. All right. Thank you all for coming. Pastor, I do yes. think it's interesting that this is what twice the size of the groups you've had here the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, I think this is a topic that hit everybody. Yeah. And and we all have an opinion on it. Um, many of us probably the same opinion, but thank you for bringing this to us. Yeah, yeah you're welcome.
Yeah, and uh, maybe in the fall we'll do something else, as uh, Brother John was suggesting, the uh, uh, theological biblical review uh, of uh, the position and what might come out of that. All right. Cool. God bless you all as we go through this new social issue together. And don't forget, I did mention uh, adoption, so you've heard it now in the church. <laughs> and parental leave. First time in 20-something years. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Admirably in balance.